Good morning, church. It's a great blessing to be here today. Welcome to the Fellowship Center and also to our live stream audience. And welcome our friends from the north, all the way from Arkansas. Glad you guys came to be with us today. What a blessing. I spent a little time in Junction City myself back in the day, so uh, we wish you guys well uh, in your tournament. So uh, I'm a little hoarse, <clears throat> and I apologize for that. But yesterday, we took a little pilgrimage down to Baton Rouge, which is red stick for you French uh, lovers. And uh, we took a red stick to the Crimson Tide yesterday. We can be glad about that, can't we? This is still an LSU crowd, right? I missed something in the... So we, uh, I took my, some of my grandkids down. So I was, you know, a little bit swept with emotion, just the idea of being there, the place that I have so many great memories uh, as, as a boy, later as a man, to be able just to, to be a part of something that was so great in athletics at a college. I'm hoping that greed and selfish ambition don't ruin it uh, for the future, but uh, it might. But uh, it was really great. And uh, so we went to gymnastics on Friday night. Did you guys know gymnastics was a big deal at LSU? It really is. And they were having a meet with Kentucky. And it was my first time to go. And the kids were loving it, you know. And I watched enough Olympics to know kind of what was going on. But, I mean, they're cheering and going crazy. And then there's one of the Kentucky gymnasts fell off the beam, which was sad, you know, for her but good for LSU, right? Because that meant we we're probably gonna win. And then the referee comes in and says there was an equipment malfunction and everybody started booing. Now I didn't boo because I didn't know if it was socially acceptable to boo a gymnast, <laughs> right? I mean, they're so short, they're so small and they seem so nice and dainty. And yet it was just raining down. I was like, well, welcome to LSU, I guess. I mean. So we lost on that one, but we beat Alabama. But it was really great for me. And, you know, when we were walking out, Corbin, who's my seven-year-old grandson and my namesake, we were talking about everything of the day and seeing Mike the Tiger. And I said, what do you think, Corbin? He said, well, the basketball game was awesome, my first game. And I love seeing Mike the Tiger. And I love seeing the stadium. And, Pap, that's why we don't watch gymnastics. And I said, well, you're right. <laughs> I'm glad he gets it early. Uh, but anyway, welcome. Glad you guys are here. Layton, if you'll come up. This is Perky's mic, by the way, in the booth. Where's Layton at? There you are. Come on up, Layton. Layton Flanders. Yeah. Thank you, Samuel, for that. He's going to have our scripture for today. If he can find it on his phone. It's okay. Technology. God said, let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness, they said, may, it, may they rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the livestock and the wild animals, and all, over all the creatures that move along the ground. God created mankind in his own image. In his own image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Amen. Thank you, brother. Layden is uh, very active in our youth group and uh, volunteers in our children's ministry. He likes to play the guitar uh, as well as a good kid. Uh, we have a lot of good kids around here. Do my, you like my glasses? I was, I was hoping it made me look smarter. That's what I was going for. Is it working for you? I guess you'll, you'll find out. Well, three people. Thank you. Uh, you're like, well, we'll see you in 30 minutes, right? That really worked out for you. I'm having so many problems with the allergies, it's hard for me to wear my contacts. So last week, uh, Mike, he wrapped up sort of the, the uh, liberty and idolatry section of this letter. And obviously there were a lot of issues. We've been dealing with issues ever since we got into this Corinthian letter. Uh, and it was, and we, as we talked about before, it, it was a unique letter because Paul had some specific problems with this church, and he had been there a year and a half, and so it's, it's very personal to Paul. And so he's trying to deal with these issues, and as we said, we're only dealing with one half of the equation because we're dealing with the answers, and we really didn't know what the questions were. Because he kept saying, let me address this now, let me address this, let me address that. It's also, uh, as Larry Bowles pointed out a few weeks ago, it's why this book is different, this letter, than the others, because it, it would be the difference in you, say, writing an article about something versus writing a personal email, right? It's, you would view those things and, and have a different attack or approach. 
So you read the book of Romans or you read the book of Hebrews. And I mean, it's just clear. He's laying out common problems for everybody. We get to, we get to Corinth and we have some unique and specific problems that he's having to deal with. And it makes it a little more difficult when you try to apply that in modern culture, any culture for that matter. Uh, we know that there's two things working against this church. One is their cultural norm that's going on. Larry did a beautiful job of painting that picture. I mean, there were some unique problems in Corinth that the other cities that Paul deals with didn't have. And so they're having to deal with that. And they're having to deal with that inside the church. It's not easy. They're also having to deal with spiritual maturity. <clears throat> Remember, this is a brand new church. So you know, when there's problems in the church, you hopefully have a strong leadership and some maturity that you can turn to and say, we need your help. Can you help us with this situation? But remember, this is brand new. There are no seasoned elders. There are no people that have been there and leading for a long time. This is just brand new. And so they're having to learn some of these things together. So Paul says at the beginning of Corinthians, there were two forces that were at work for them. And these are timeless. One was the message of the cross that never changes, that will always work. You can always reset to that. Church has problems. Man, we're, we're about to fall apart. We're about to split. We got all these issues going on. Reset on the message of the cross. That's your reset, the gospel of Jesus. You come back there, you can start dealing with whatever problems that you have. Second thing they had working for them was the wisdom that comes from the Spirit. Jesus told the disciples, when I leave here, I will not leave you alone. So no matter how new you are, no matter how immature you are, no matter how many problems you have in the church, my spirit, the mind of Christ now lives in you. So you've always got a way to appeal to God. We're never alone. Now, you just think about this. Anytime a church has issues, if you can, you can rely on those two things, the message of the cross and the wisdom of the spirit, we're always going to be able to make it. Now, part of the cultural issue that we've been dealing with, we dealt with in 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to deal with it today in 1 Corinthians 11. We'll deal with it again in 1 Corinthians 14. It's because they had some unique situations, especially with their women in their culture. Uh, Larry did a great job of kind of describing what that was in this idol worship and this debauchery that was going on within their culture. Some of that's bleeding over into the church. And so we're having some problems. And Paul is trying to deal with these issues. Lines are being blurred on gender. Now, this has come back around, and it usually does, and we're dealing with the same thing in our culture, different from what it looked like here, but the blurring lines of gender is exactly what we're dealing with in our own culture. And the church will deal with it. I mean, right now we look at it, it's pretty simple. We understand male and female, which is what we're going to talk about today. But as we know, we look out. I look at these young people here visiting today. Their world is a different world than my world or the generation before me. And they're going to have to deal with this inside the church and outside the church. It's the real deal. And so really today's lesson and what Paul is bringing forth in 1 Corinthians 11 is going to help us to be able to understand that and get back to some basic simplicity of what God has established for us. So there's three things we're going to talk about today out of this text. And the first one is God's established order. And remember, it's God's order. It's not value. And it's important to remember. We get in the text, you'll understand what I mean. Look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Mike used that last week as sort of a conclusion verse for what he had been talking about, what we've been talking about for several weeks. But it's also an introductory verse into what we're talking about today. Anytime we're following the example of Christ, we're leading in such a way that others can follow us as we follow him. That's going to work 100% of the time. Follow me as long as I'm following the example that Jesus has set. And so that's how he's going to start this. Verse 2. Praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. Now, I'll stop for just a second because some scholars think he, that he may have been being sarcastic with that comment. They had so many problems. I don't think he was, but since sarcasm is one of my love languages, I kind of wish it was, you know? 
thanks a lot for doing everything I've asked you to do. Roll your eyes, right? I get it. I don't think that's what he was meaning. I, I think he meant, oh, look, you're, gi- you're giving it your best. You're doing what you can. Because then he says this word in verse 3, this conjunction. But I want you to realize, so whatever he's dealing with, here's something important. I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So what he's saying here, we got some problems. We're going to deal with those problems. But we're going to start by remembering God's order, not value, order. You say, why do you keep saying that? Because you got the father, the son, you got man, you got woman. All valuable. In fact, the same value. When you look inside the Godhead and you see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they all have different roles, right? They have different roles as it impacts us in salvation. But none of them are less valuable to one another. Same thing with a man or woman, or a husband and a wife. Different roles equal value. This is not about taking away value from any group of people or any gender of people, which unfortunately is what happens so many times in this text. Roles don't equal value. They establish order. And when order is established, you have functionality and you have peace. That's what comes from order. Peace. When you don't have that, you have confusion, a lot of confusion, and you have chaos, and you have dysfunctionality. That's the result when you begin to blur the order that God has laid out. Now, that sounds pretty simple, right? And yet, as we know from the world around us, it's not so simple for people to understand that. One of the ways I always like to illustrate this is thinking about birth order. Now, I'm the oldest son. Lisa says, also the wisest and best looking in my family, (laughs) which I appreciate her saying that. But let's face it, the bar is low. You see my family, right? (laughs) So, but I'm no more valuable in my family than my siblings, even though I do play a different role among them. The oldest typically does. And it's not the same for every family, but in our family, trust me, anybody tell you this, I can tell you, I play a different role in the family, being the oldest. They come to me. They call me the Phil Whisperer. (laughs) That's what they call me. There's a reason why. Because I can deal with dad. I can get him to do things, you know, that other people can't get him to do. That's my role. But I'm no more valuable than Jeb. In fact, he's the baby. He's the favorite. Sometimes it would seem he's more valuable than me or Phyllis or Willie or Jace. Our roles are different, even though there's a different order in how we came into the family. And there's different roles that we play within that family. That's exactly what we're seeing here. A woman is no less valuable than a man. In fact, she's humanity 2.0. I mean, God first made the man out of the dust of the earth. And then he said, all right, man, see how you like it alone. I don't like it. Seems like I'm missing something. So then he made a woman out of the man, out of that rib. And then there was a completion of humanity. And then they began to bring forth other human beings into the world. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 11, which we're gonna get to in a moment, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Order, right? You can't have one without the other in humanity. We know that. And yet you look around at the world around us and you begin to wonder, do they understand this principle? Sometimes I think not. In Genesis, we read that God created mankind in His image. That's the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image. Multiple. Multiple value, equal value, but order. Let us make man in our image. And then He made him in two stages. Galatians 3, Paul put it this way. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 
For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And when Paul said that to the Galatians, there were still slave and free. There were still Jews and Gentiles. There were still males and females. So what's he talking about? In Christ, all valuable, all equal, all one. That's what he's saying. So whatever we get from this text, we can't miss that because that's the most important thing. Equal value, structural order, and different roles. Now, by the way, that combination, that formula works in anything. It works in business. It works in sports. It works in anything. You have an order and a structure, leadership. You have equal value because no teammate, no associate is more important than anybody else on getting the job done. And then we all have the same value and project and idea of where we're going. That works in any scenario, including the family, and also including in the church and the kingdom of God. So let's get to the rest of this, because here's where it gets a little blurry. Look at verse 4. Because we got God's order, not value. Now we got God's genders, and it's really not about the veils, because that's what people try to make this about. Let's read it. Verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Now, before I go further, let me just tell you, the Old Testament is full of contradictions to that one statement. There were people praying with their head covered and men all throughout the Old Testament. In fact, leadership wore a shawl to put over their head when they would pray and prophesy. So Paul's got to be talking about something different than that. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head covered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. Uh Uh-oh, we got a clue. Because that's a weird statement. You know, even to this day, women don't typically shave their head. In fact, throughout history, it was even a punishment to women uh, to dishonor them when they were caught in some situation. I mean, the only exception I can think of is when someone gets cancer and, you know, because of the drugs, they lose all their hair. But even then, and there's some of you women here today that have experienced this, you didn't seem comfortable not having your hair. So there's something about that that's innate, which again is the clue of what he's talking about. Verse 6, for if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. He says it again. But if if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or head shaved, then she should cover her head. It seems confusing. It's really not when you think about it. If the problem is a gender issue, not necessarily the hair or the veil issue. A man ought not to cover his head. One of the the in the if you look it says have long hair, since he is the image and glory of God. Now once again, there's a lot of people of God throughout history who had long hair. In fact, we know from Samson's case, it was even his strength and glory was in his hair. So again, it's not talking about that. It's got to be talking about something more. Am I cutting in and out? Help me out, guys. Let me know if it's me. Since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but women, woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for that a woman are authority over her own head or the margin says a sign of authority, because of the angels. There's another weird one that Paul sticks in there. What does that mean? I don't know. It's crazy. I think it probably means that, you know, angels had some authority issues going on because of what we read about. They got out of their roles, and there was a whole rebellion that happened, but we know so little about them. But he throws that in there. And again, he's talking to people he's been with for a year and a half. They got it. It's a little weird to me. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is independent of woman. But as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Now, let me just take a second, and let's be real, and let's be practical. 
out of this text in many different groups through centuries, we have had doctrine and we have had rules set up about veils or no veils, head covering or no head covering, the length of hair for men and the length of hair for women. Now, I'm talking about litmus tests for the kingdom. Can a man wear a hat in the building or any place indoors? Can a woman? Does it only matter if they're praying or prophesying and not doing something else? And on and on and on. There's been a lot out of this one text. You know what's interesting about it? Again, back to the uniqueness of this letter to these people. He doesn't do this to the Galatians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, to the Romans, to the church, original church in Jerusalem. None of this. Anytime you're looking in Scripture and you see somebody then with something unique and special in one place, you need to really think about that before you start making these wide band rules for everybody. I mean, that's, that's just the truth about studying the Bible. You don't have to understand or misunderstand about the gospel or the things that are important when you read Romans and some of the other, verse, uh, other verses and books. But when you read this, man, this seems confusing. But it wouldn't to them. They get it. So I'm, I'm just going to say something very profound. You ready? Let's hope this mic doesn't cut out in this moment because you're going to miss it. This is big. You want to hear a simple explanation of that entirely confusing text? Here it is. If you're a man, look and act like a man. If you're a woman, look and act like a woman. I mean, is that too simple? Because I think that's what he was telling them. Now, I know all the bells and whistles are what we love to talk about, but at its simple best, that's what he's saying. And then people say, well, you know, in this, this day and age, I don't know what it looks like. Oh, yeah, we do. Now, the world has tried to make it confusing for us. It's not confusing. God made gender in his image. He made them male and he made them female. Now, something else is happening. And look, there are some exceptions to that. Not many, but some. But like most things, Satan and the world like to take the exception and then just blow that out for everybody. There are some people born and they're not sure. I mean, physically, you have both parts and you got to figure that out. And my heart goes out to folks like that. That's tough. But it's not any different than anybody being born with anything that's different. You can't take that and then apply that and say, well, we're going to let people decide what they are. It's not God. It's not his order. And you know what it creates? It creates chaos and confusion and dysfunction. Is that not a description of the world we live in today? I don't know about you guys, but I turn on the news, I'm shaking my head at everything I hear. This makes no sense. Now, Jace is famous on the podcast for saying, but to dad and me, because we'll get going about the culture, that these letters apply to the church and us and the kingdom, and he's right. But we have to live that example out. We've got to show the world what it looks like to have a man and a woman act like a man and a woman and understand that the roles are different. The roles are different in marriage. The roles are different in family. The roles are even different in culture and in the church. We realize that. We're built differently by the design of God. You say, well, I don't know where to look. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a looking place. Now, I'm just going to speak for the whole group. We'll start with our elders and their wives right here at WFR. You're a part of our community. You're not sure what a man or woman looks like? I want you to spend a little time with that couple because I can vouch for every one of them. There are men who look and act like men, women who look and act like women, and both understand their role in their marriage, in their family, and in the church. I trust these people with my life. That's the example we have to set for people. We have to show that. Remember how we started this? Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. The same when it comes to gender. He repeats in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 11, so we'll finish with that thought. Judge for yourselves 
Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things, he goes back to that again, nature, teach you that if a man has long hair, is it, is, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? And again, he's speaking in generalities. Some men have long hair, but for the most part, they don't. Some women have short hair. For the most part, they don't. But we understand femininity and masculinity. And it's really not an air issue, is it? It's much more. The evil one has been trying to take away the masculinity of our culture for a pretty good while. And I hate to say he's been successful in a lot of places. So much so that laws are being made that children, preteens, can make decisions that they will regret for the rest of their life and are able to do it without even speaking to their parents. Does that sound like chaos and dysfunction to you? It's insanity. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, he finishes, we have no other practice. In other words, that's just the way we do it here. Nor do the churches of God. God's order, not value, we're all valuable. God's gender it's not about veils, it's not even about hair. It's much more. And then the last thought I want to give you is God's glory, not human vanity. Because it's about glorifying God. And Jace is right, it starts with us. If Ryan and Miranda Lee, I'll just pick somebody that I can pick on. If they show up next Sunday and Ryan looks like RuPaul, those of you in the culture know what that looks like, and Miranda looks like Mr. Clean. I can almost tell you before they can get in the door good, there's some of our leadership that we're going to have what we call a backroom meeting. <laughs> we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about how inappropriate this is to look this way because we shepherd the flock. But we do that because we do want to deal with people. You know, if, if, in fact, people could take this clip and put it out on the internet. If you do it, you do it. And look at, look at that guy. Listen, one of those Roberts said, you talk about transphobic. I have no phobia of trans people. Homosexual people, sexually immoral people. I have no phobia of any. I have the love of Christ that changes lives and hearts. Yeah. And can and allow people to be who God made them to be. That's what I have. Well, it sure doesn't sound like it. Well, you need to hang around and listen some more. Because people have had taken me to the back room about some of my lifestyle choices and said, Al, no good. That was not hate speech. That was love speech. Someone loved me enough to say, you're going to kill yourself if you keep living this way. And that's what I would say to anybody in this world. The gospel of Jesus brings glory. In Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, you see some pretty vile stuff that Paul mentions in Romans. The key is they did not glorify God, but they exchanged the glory of God for, and you fill in the blank. And there's a lot of stuff that's being filled in the blank. Men who try to look and act like women, and women who try and act, try to look and act like men, bring no glory to God. Men who devalue and mistreat women because of God's order, and that's happened a lot out of this text, that brings no glory to God or to women. That's a shame. People of faith have misused this to devalue and demean women through the centuries. That's not of God. God gets no glory in that. Women who blame God and hate men because of God's order, bring no glory to God. We were at the Trump inauguration in 16, and it, I think it was on a Friday. The next day was a Saturday, and they had the Nasty Women March. That's what they called it. And let me just let you know, because I was leaving town, but from what I saw of the march, it was aptly named. I felt so bad. 
I thought, man, there's mothers, fathers spread out across this country saying, what happened? What happened to my baby girl? Nasty. No glory. Men and women who do not follow the example of Jesus Christ bring no glory to God. That's what this text is about. God getting glory. I want to close with Hebrews 2, verse 9, because here's what it should look like. We do, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels. See, Jesus had no problem. He said, I'll go become a human being. I'll be even lower than the beings that are here in my realm because I love people that much. That's what I want to be like. What about my rights? What about this? What about that? What about making yourself lower to help others? But now he's crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He did it for our glory. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, and isn't it better when you think about male and female, husband and wife, what are we going to do? What if we're just a son and a daughter of the Almighty? That sounds pretty equal to me. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Verse 11 both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. I look back on mine and Lisa's life, and you can ask her about this too. You know, I realize we didn't understand God's order for so much of our young, early marriage. And so guess what? Chaos, dysfunction, dishonor, and the one thing we weren't doing was bringing glory to God. You know when it all fell into place for us? We quit, we quit looking at ourselves and decided to fully submit ourselves to God and to Jesus. And then that allowed us to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And Lisa was able then to submit to me as the head of our family and her husband not in a way that dishonored her. I, she's the most valuable person to me in the world. How could I ever mistreat her? But I had to come to an understanding of that because of my relationship with Christ. All the things bad that come out of marriage and family come out because we don't understand the order of who God is. You get that straight, and the other stuff will work itself out. That's who we're called to be. But it starts by first us being a follower of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 14, which we'll get to later, says that God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. If you don't have peace in your life, but chaos, dysfunction, disorder, it's probably because you don't have it right first with him. Maybe you've never committed yourself for the first time to being a follower of Jesus. Today's the day you could do that. You embrace him. You say, Christ, I want to follow you so that I can set an example for someone else. And that begins with your submission and faith in who he is, that you commit your life to live for him. We've got water behind me. There's water wherever you are that's watching. I mean, three quarters of the globe is covered with water. And he says, I want you to go and have someone lower you into water to commit to that faith. That's what baptism does, a reenactment with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if you're a Christian and a believer, but you've just lost your way, the way home is so easy. It's as easy as understanding I want to, if I'm a man, I want to look and act like a man. If I'm a woman, I want to look and act like a woman. It's Jesus, I need help. I've lost my vision. I haven't been focused on you. Let's get this thing going. That's the step to make. So whatever your need is today, to be right and to follow his order and understand his agenda for who you are in the reign of glory. Why don't you come while we stand and while we sing, if we can help you today.